Hello, lovely people. Whoa, that's loud. It's an honor to be here at Wolf Summit. I love Wrocław, being born in Krakow, but having worked and had my career in London for the best part, it's amazing to be back. Um, yeah, look forward to having some pierogi later. <laughs> this is most probably the most controversial presentation of this conference, hopefully also entertaining and hopefully a little bit inspiring, perhaps. But it's a little bit out of ordinary. So have you ever actually considered that showing your naked ass to a bunch of strangers can help you become a better leader? If you haven't, <laughs> I'm about to tell you how exactly that happened for me. So just, you know, so it's on the record, I'm a serious businesswoman, I'll give you my businesswoman credentials in a bit. The images behind me, some of them will be from stage in cabaret clubs, are of my alter ego, pal, and I cannot be held responsible for what my alter ego does. So I hope that this dirty secret can stay between us and it won't drive my business career into the pavement. So the reason why I'm talking about this is not because I suspect a lot of you here do burlesque, but every single one of you has a wild side. That's aliveness. That's why I love startup people. We have that thirst for life. And I believe if you really reconnect with that wildness within us, we're not only fuller human beings, we are better leaders. And this is what this presentation is about. Balesque is just a context because that's my wild side. And in the next 20 minutes, I will tell you a bit more about how to reconnect with that wildness. I don't know if you have that experience, but I definitely have that at some point working super hard on my second startup, I lost my connection with my play playfulness, with my creativity. So how to reconnect with that and how the power of sensuality, embodiment, uh, wildness, any kind of crazy hobby or craving that you have, if you embrace it, it can make you and will make you more powerful. Great, so the serious bit. Let's get it out of the way. So the list is just pleasure, shall we? Uh, I am an entrepreneur. I have a company called Grant Tree in London, which I am at this point an advisor to. So I stepped away um, to focus on personal projects. Um, there is 50 people over in it. We've got about 4 million turnovers. So we're not a huge you know, tech unicorn, but we're doing well. And uh, what I'm most proud of is that we're the kind of company that has managed to uh, more about this later, achieve, kind of, or is striving to achieve that balance between profitability and well-being of people. Profitability, sustainability, yes, commercial sustainability, it's important. And the well-being of people, humanity, because we're not in business just for the sake of making a bunch of cash and exiting. We're here to honestly do something great. I believe we're wired as human beings to do something great. Okay, so back to the credentials. I am also an angel investor, so my um, entrepreneurial moderate success has enabled me to do something I've always wanted to do, which is to invest in startups, give back to the startup scene as something I always wanted to do. I'm a massive believer in human potential. Uh, and I've met amazing people in the startup scene. Um, I'm a keynote speaker. I have a book which I've just released, uh, which is on Amazon's hot new release list. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about this a little bit later. So this is my team back in the day when what... So we are at Grant Tree. We get government grants and equity-free funding for entrepreneurs, mostly in the UK. That was back in the day where we were celebrating raising 50 million 
for startups. By now, this figure is over 200 million. So we've done, we had a bit of an impact in terms of securing free money for entrepreneurs. And these are my showgirl credentials. <laughs> so I'll tell you in a little bit how I kind of decided and what made me stumble upon that path. But what has happened in the last few years is that I have performed internationally, I've hosted nights where other performers were the stars, I was featured in magazines, I was in Venetian Carnival. I honestly, I've had a life. I've had a life. <laughs> it's been fun. It's been probably the greatest adventure of my life. And this is how I started. So I started Grand Tree in 2010 as my second business. And maybe two or three years into the development of it, I was freaking exhausted. And it wasn't just the kind of exhaustion where you're tired at the end of the day. I felt drained. I felt like my spirit, my rebelliousness, my creativity, like the part of me which, which I love the most, the part of me that makes me alive, that part was dying because I was in my head most of the time. I was a competent businesswoman. I've discovered I can do really well doing business with CEOs, CFOs, um, making sales. Yeah, my team knows me as a saleswoman from hell. That's something I do well. And I've kind of started to lose that beauty, that sparkle. And there was this one particular day, for those of you who have been to London, um, I guess that's most of you, um, I was in Piccadilly Circus just on my way to a business meeting. And I was walking from Piccadilly Circus to Leicester Square, and as I was walking, there is a place on my left, and it's called Café de Paris. And I was like, what the hell is that? So I kind of peeked inside, and it was the afternoon, so there were no shows in there. It's a cabaret club, yes. But they were having a burlesque show rehearsal. And I was like, wow. Like my jaw dropped. Not because I saw like sequins and peacock feathers and like crazy stuff, but because I saw that aliveness, that freedom. I've just, oh, I've missed. I've saw that on that stage, those performers kind of really freely expressing themselves, and I just thought, that's not me. That's not me. That's that's another life. I've kind of taken on this businesswoman, startup girl identity. I'm into serious stuff, making money, hiring people, la 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 la. Maybe another life. And then I thought, I don't have another life. What if I could be everything that I want? So, with my businesswoman hat on, I made a decision, executive decision, and I've switched on my or switched off my slides. Let's see. Ooh, okay. We back on. And I made an executive decision in that moment. I was going to find out how one becomes a burlesque showgirl. I've taken it on as a serious project. I've emailed people, I reached out to my network and I was like, do you know? Is there any kind of training? How do I get to become a showgirl? And in the next few days, I got a few emails, and one of my friends suggested a school, a burlesque school called The Cheek of It. So, I went for a course. Oh my god. I loved it. There were several women on it. We were all developing our acts. The sisterhood, the empowerment, the vulnerability of it as well. It was beautiful. And then I started performing, and the rest is history. So, it, back then, I didn't see yet that that would be the beginning of a sensual embodiment revolution in my life, which would really change how I show up in business. Because it has. I've written a book about it. <laughs> so, great. That's me. But what can any embodied hobby 
martial arts. Um, I've met people in other conferences that said to me, oh, since I started doing martial arts, things changed. Or since I started doing acting classes, things changed. So how any embodied hobbies can do that for you, can really help you strengthen your leadership. So what burlesque did for me, it helped me to drop into my feminine side. And that's like really when we say feminine, we think fluffy and disorganized and all sorts of things. But what I'm actually talking about here, I used to be very much in my masculine leadership center, which meant I was organized and I was ambitious and I was competitive and I was on it. But I was not really in a place where I could listen, where I could stop and be in the moment, where I could really nurture my team, really be there for them. I was not even in a place where I could tune into, like, what are my like, higher aspirations? Why am I doing this? I was so focused kind of on sh short term, I need to get to the next profit goal. And from there, I need to go to the next this. And from there, I need to go. And I've lost not just the playfulness and the creativity, but I've lost kind of the sense of a bigger vision and the sense of attunement with myself. Intuitions. There's so much to be said about the gut and about being able to not just analyze the pros and the cons when you're making a decision, but really feel into what is right. Feel into what is right. And you know, the gut and the body responds seconds, I think, or maybe milliseconds, before we have a conscious thought about what is the right thing to do. There are more nerve endings, I've read, in the gut than there are in the brain. So that says something. Um, listening skills, something I already alluded to. So when I say listening, I don't just mean being able to stay quiet. Even that is difficult for me sometimes, <laughs> because when someone's talking, I'm like, oh, what's the next thing I want to say? <sighs> but what I'm really saying is listening deeper. So let's say I'm having a business meeting with a client or a potential client. What I mean by listening is tuning into what is happening beneath the layer of words. Who is this being that's kind of sat or stood in front of me? Like, what are their real desires? What's really driving them in this situation? What are their needs they're trying to get met through maybe doing this business deal with me? How can I bring our needs and desires to a place where they can meet? So that's what I mean by listening. Um, it taught me about tuning into chemistry between people and in situations. So the reason why I love performing and I love being on stage as well, it's not just because I'm a bit of an attention whore. <laughs> it's also because um, I can feel this kind of stunning, energetic connection that's between me and the audience. And it's even more obvious in a cabaret show or in a stand-up comedy show, I suppose, when you're on stage and like you say something and people react and they say woo or they laugh or they and it just feels like wow there's an exchange. This is beautiful. Like this is what happens like underneath the layer of words. Like how we communicate really as beings. It's just in business that we kind of adopt those. Okay, let's do it. But there's just so much happening uh, between the words, so much happening beneath the words. Um, and performing taught me to be able to kind of tune into that a little bit better. I'm still learning, of course. Um, so I started to listen to my body when making decisions, and I'm just, just talking about the gut. I'm also a Tantra student, and there is actually a practice which I really, really like, which can really help you when you're trying to make a difficult decision. And you want to use your body, you want to use the power of your body to help you out. So, we've got an inner community within us. 
And what I mean by that is that we've got multiple voices that we can tune into, and one of them will be the voice of the head. Most of us, me included, are very familiar with that. Then there'll be the voice of the heart, and that's more around kind of love, well-being of everything, everybody. There'll be the voice of the gut, which I've spoken about, so that's more like intuition. It's more like, hmm, what's the, you know, yeah, the, the thing, you know? Does it, does it feel good? And then there is an um, energy of your sexual center as well, which is around excitement, which is around heaviness, and I've done it again. I'm really not too good at this, am I? Ah, great. So, those voices combined can really give you a lot of clues. And a lot of the time, you'll hear like the, the head saying, yes, there's a like good, good, good list, of, uh, list of pros. It's definitely longer than the list of cons. It's a yes, and then the heart will be, hmm. I'm not sure, I'm not sure actually. And then the gut might be telling you something else and the sexual center or something else. And how do you even reconcile that? So, what you do is you, called an, you call an inner board meeting. Um, I like to say to people that I have an inner board of directors that help me make decisions. And then you can kind of hold those meetings where you allow them to negotiate and to kind of state their reasons and kind of see, you know, which voice is stronger and how to help the other voices get what they kind of need out of the situation. Um, it got me comfortable with sticking out being seen. So, when you're a burlesque artist, um, and there are quite a lot of like, girls and boys and people of other genders uh, graduating from burlesque schools, you really got to have that thing to make it into a bit of a career. You really need to have a brand, something that you do, something that you represent, something that people remember. So for me, I sing in my acts, I'm quite controversial, I'm very self-ironic, I make fun of things. Um, I'm very irreverent. But different people have different things that they do in their acts. Some play with fire, some do juggling, some do whatever. Um, and as an entrepreneur, you really need to be comfortable with sticking out. Because there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be pissed off. And the more disruptive you are, the more people you're going to piss off because they have a vested interest in things running in a particular way. So you've got to get comfortable with being seen and with pissing people off. And being a stripper, being a performer, help me. Because once you show your naked ass to crowd people, there are not that many things that are very scary anymore. And it taught me about vulnerability. Um, and there is a lot to be said for vulnerability in business. I could probably do a whole talk about it. Wink, wink, Mike. <laughs> um, what I'm going to say is that I also have like a big and challenging journey to do with mental health, not just behind me, but a journey that I'm still on. And what I learned is that the more I'm able to show up in my vulnerability to my team, the more I'm creating space or giving them permission to not always be at their best. Because we're humans. And I've had people on my team lose their parents. I've had them give birth. I've had them go through all sorts of stuff that, yes, are going to affect their performance. And yes, there are going to be days where you hate what you do, even if you love what you do. There are going to be days when you hate it. So it's okay to not always be on top of your game, and it is going to happen. And it makes it normal, and it makes it fine. And if you give people permission to not always be on, at their best, you're going to see them shine. Like, that's what happened to me. Like, they haven't before. Um, 
So strippers and leaders are prepared to go all out, to really kind of act as if there's nothing to lose. And I kind of a, have a question for you. What would happen in your business if you really put all the inhibitions to the side? If you're not playing safe anymore? If you really chose to make a mark with who you are as a business, with what your impact is, with what you want to achieve in the world, how you want to change your industry. Okay, so being a showgirl taught me about uh, letting go. So uh, there was a time, and there's a, like a, a little club in London, which is like not very it's a little bit dodgy for performing in it because it's very, very small. It used to be like a men's toilet underground, so a very small space, but they changed it into this like plush club. So it's kind of cool, but it's not great to perform in. And I once turned up, and there were many people, there was like no stage area. I would be basically almost touching people here. And I was like, I don't, I don't feel good about this. So I left. I just said, you know, we don't have any contract where I actually committed to being here. I'm okay with not getting paid for this. I just don't feel comfortable. And there was um, some talk about stars in business. <laughs> okay. um, I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm shit at. What I'm good at is making a fire, starting things up, um, just creating something out of nothing. I love it. I'm not great at scaling businesses. I'm not great at implementing things and systems that will basically grow and help the company scale. So, a couple of years back, I actually, with the help of my co-founder, appointed the new CEO. And I knew it was time for me to let go. Setting boundaries, understanding your limits. So, like I set that boundary in my performance life because I didn't feel comfortable, in the same way I've learned that I'm still learning to put a boundary of where my personal life begins and professional life ends. For example, or what's okay, what feels okay in me, what feels fair, and what doesn't feel fair. So that's, that's a lifelong journey to kind of like feel into this, these things. But again, being a performer, having like a strong connection with my body has helped me to home in on that. Yeah, so I talked about the feminine side and connecting with desires and passions. And um, being a performer like really helped me to connect to that like hunger for life, which I was slowly losing as I was more systematic and more logical and more, you know, success, business success oriented. Um, and it helped me actually, the way it helped me in business was to really connect to like, what am I trying to change in my industry? And my industry is freaking boring. <laughs> Unlike you guys, a lot of you at least those who run startups. My company, what we do, the way we do it is interesting. What we do is boring. Uh, we write grant applications and bids and la, 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 la. And this industry is full of people who are trying to make money, trying to make a quick buck, are not necessarily very open, not necessarily very progressive, not necessarily very even, don't have that much care about their clients, I feel. Um, so yeah, I'll tell you in a second like what my company looks like, but that's it. Dropping into the moment, yeah, so <laughs> I remember that first performance I did where my first act was about this businesswoman who was like, so I obviously made fun of myself, who is like this uh, corporate dragon and she's like stomping on dead bodies of men on her way to the top. And underneath it all, all she wants in the bedroom, of course, is to surrender is to be taken, is to be wanted, you know? And that was the, what the act was about. And I was really well prepared because it was my first act, it was my first performance. I was obviously freaking out a little bit, 
but I nailed it in terms of preparation. So I walked on that stage, I stood there for a second, and I <laughs> dropped a glove. And people were like, oh, what's going on? It was really good. And then I started singing, and then I started stripping, and blah, 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 blah. And when I got off that stage, I was ecstatic. I was like, this is what I live for, this kind of connection with, the, with people, yeah, with audience in that, in that case. Like, this feels amazing. It felt like a huge, like, the, the only time this word is going to be used on this stage in this conference, orgasm in my head. It felt like, bam! This is me. Hello, world. And um, in the same way, I'm learning to find that place in myself of being like really here, really connected um, in business. And it's not always easy, because some business meetings are boring, let's face it. And some of the stuff you're going to do in your business life is hugely uninspiring. It's just going to be that. But I'm trying to find that place of liberation, of like connectedness, freedom. And then it feels good again, of why I'm doing this, you know? Okay, I um, don't think I've got that much time, so I'll kind of start whizzing through things. We don't want Mike to be angry. Uh, <laughs> I learned that sexual and sen sensual life force can be used effectively in the business context. So I'm not talking here about like, going to business meetings like massively turned on with like ants in your pants. That's not what it's about. Sexual life force in Tantra, Eros, equals life force. So if you're connected to your body, to your desires and sexual desires as well, you come alive and it shows. And there is that magnetism that startup people very often have, particularly at the beginning of their ventures, where they, you can see the passion, you can see the why, you can see why they're doing this. Um, so, yeah, this is, this does change how you show up as a leader. And, yeah, sexual power in business is not about trying to seduce your co colleague or your boss, or like, oh, when people say that, it's like... <sighs> it's about a creative energy, the effectiveness, productivity, the, the, the stuff that you start to manifest as a being when you're like really connected to your body, to um, the physicality of this human thing that I am. Um, and yes, the more connected to our sexual energy you are, sexual energy understood as eros, as life force, the more, the bigger the potential for wealth, for abundance, for all these lovely things to manifest in your life. And I'm following this uh, Tantra teacher, actually, who uh, credits her success to her vagina. I love it. Um, and okay, last but not least, how to use embodiment and sensuality in your business. So what kind of things can you implement to help you and your people connect with bodies to their feminine side, etc. So yeah, feminine side, I've spoken a lot about it. Not fluffy, disorganized, emotional. Blech. It's attuned, present, playful, creative, Focused on the bigger why, the why that's bigger than your bottom line. What am I trying to change in this world? Um, and this is a really lovely concept that I like, that I write, I've written a lot about in my book, which is the inner marriage, what the Tantra calls inner marriage between the man and the woman within you. And it does not matter what gender you are. Um, we all have those kind of both sides. You can call them yin and yang, if you prefer that. And it's the leaders, and I, when I meet people like that, I can feel it. It's not just the people who are super freaking focused, and they know what they want, and they manifest like motherfuckers. Not just those people, but people who are also attuned, who are also humble, who have strong values, and you can, you can feel that. And people who have kind of both of that, that's the kind of person that I want to be. And that's the kind of people I want to hang out with, and that's why I'm here, obviously. <laughs> um, so, 
I've spoken about this already. Pay attention to he what happens underneath the layer of words. In business meetings, in things that are potentially boring, what is really going on between me and this other human being that I'm meeting with right now? What are they really trying to achieve? What are they longing for? What's going on there beyond this kind of conversation of like, yeah, or do you want to buy this? Oh, I'm not sure if I'm buying this, it's too expensive. Oh, are you sure? Like, I can dispel your doubts. Oh, no, 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 your competitors are cheap. Like, what's really going on? Like, what, what is the, like, are some of their needs being unmet? Are, are they trying to prove something to themselves or to their boss? Like, what's really, what's the real conversation? Um, so yeah, in the board meetings, talked about it already, super cool way to make decisions. There are others. Um, so there are some more sophisticated techniques. I know a company in Norway uh, that uses this model called Family Constellations. Again, uh, it's for a whole other private presentation, but they, when they have a situation that kind of needs digging underneath the surface on, Let's say they're hiring a new person and they have a couple of really great people and they don't know who to choose. They would like pick a person on the team who would represent each of the sides in this conversation. So one would represent the employee, one would the potential employee, one the employer, one would represent um, stakeholders of the company, etc. And they kind of play it out almost like a workshop it out to see what dynamics are at play there. So there's loads of stuff, and like grab me for a glass of wine later on if you want to talk about this. Um, you can use things like check-in protocols or something that we used to use at Grumtree when I was um, still working full-time in it, where we asked people at the beginning of each, each kind of potentially boring meeting, <laughs> I don't want to say just boring, to um, say, you know, hi, I'm Pau, um, I'm actually really frustrated today, um, just something that happened at home. I mean, and that kind of opportunity to bring in your humanity or your feelings actually allows you to stay present with what's going on uh, in the meeting. Or it also helps other to, others to understand, oh, she's a little bit irritated, so that's why she feels a bit edgy in this meeting. So it really kind of helps you to bring the fullness of your yeah, humanity in, into a meeting. So we, it really worked for us for a while. Um, create opportunities for your team to participate in the conversations around the bigger why, the difference you want to achieve in your industry, why, how you want to change, how you want to show up as a company, what do you want to represent. That will bring you into the feminine side of leadership as well. And introduce practices to do with culture, which empower people to really manage themselves, because we, every single one of us knows how to manage our energy best. So what we've done uh, at Grantry, um, at least during the time I was there, we had full kind of remote working, people could work at whatever time from wherever in the world, as long as, long as they got their things done. Um, and, and this is very edgy, and I have a I'm going to say again, a whole different presentation about this, uh, self-set pay. Uh, so you want, we were one of the few companies that I'm aware of that actually empowered people to do full market research, including co talking to competitors sometimes, um, and following a process that we set out to choose their own remuneration. Again, if you want to talk about it, grab me later. Really interesting uh, process. We learned a lot from it. Um, and yet, yeah, that would be it from me. It was a total pleasure. I really look forward to kind of more and more um, interesting presentations and conversations with you afterwards. Um, this is uh, my book. Um, I'm kind of doing quite a few things at the moment, so it's a little bit difficult to get into my diary. But if you'd like to speak with someone who can offer you, for example, a little bit of coaching on your presentation um, on your pitch. I've invested in 12 startups. I've got a large NFT portfolio as well, so I've got some expertise on that. Um, or if you have something in your company from the cultural perspective that could use a bit of somebody else's kind of eyeballs on it.
please get my book, email me. I'll find five two units in my diary to talk to you. Yeah, that's all from me. Thank you so much, Mike, for having me. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here for this final talk of the day. <laughs>